Dave's five hot takes. Yeah. We're back, folks. It's Dave. So excited to be here with you guys uh, talking about some hot takes. And, you know, these, these takes range. You know, they go from molten lava to mildly cool to that middle, like that pizza you ordered when you were in middle school and you've been waiting all night. You've been, you hadn't eaten anything all day and it's sitting there steaming hot and you think, you know, this is going to burn the hashishi out of my mouth, but I'm going to bite into it. And sure, that first or second bite hurts like a mother. But by that third or fourth, can't feel it anymore. So also that kind of heat. So, uh, you know, buckle up because it's time for some hot takes. Hot take one. So this week I was driving in my car and I was I was jamming. We were jamming. Me and the kids, we were jamming. And uh, Christina Aguilera's uh, What a Girl Wants came on. What I just still can't do that vocally. But you know what I love about vocal lick? She's charged with the fla. Fla She's got to give you the flood to get in there. That's the entry point on that lick. Um, and I realized something about that song that's really genius in the production and or the songwriting. I don't know which one figured this out. But she starts the chorus with the end of that phrase. So instead of starting with the beginning of the phrase like traditional choruses would do, she starts the chorus with the end of that phrase with the wants of what a girl wants, what a girl needs. And then the middle of the chorus, she starts the middle of the chorus with the beginning of the phrase, what a girl wants, what a girl needs. So she flips the phrases so that she begins the chorus with the end of it and in the middle of the chorus, she starts at the beginning of it. So instead of both of them landing at the same place throughout the chorus, they land at completely different times, which is a mathematical equation of, of geniusity. I'm, I can't, every time I listen to that song, I'm like whoever was the lyricist for that day or working on the, the uh, melody must have been like, okay, wait, how are we going to land that? And they made it work, and it is glorious. And it's so good, and again, so many things like this, are particularly effective when you don't notice they're doing them. And I would imagine most of you, if you know that song, never stop to think, oh, isn't it interesting when they enter the song, she goes, what a girl wants, in this beginning, what a girl needs, in the middle of the chorus, she goes, what a girl wants, oh, Christina, you're so tricky. So big shout out to all those people that made that happen, because that is nothing short of like mathematical lyric, lyric geniusity. I toast all of you. Hot take two. Coming in pretty hot on this one, folks, I'll warn you. Put on the mittens. Uh, <laughs> I love Taylor Goldsmith from Dawes and his lyrics. Um, he's a great songwriter. And I would argue he's one of the best lyricists of this generation. Um, I know, like, don't swing at me, because uh, there's a lot of really great ones. But Taylor sort of ticks a lot of boxes for me, which is they're sincere, it's vulnerable, um, but most of all, they really go with what he's singing and the melody in the songs he's writing. So it doesn't feel like, sometimes I can find really great lyrics, but you sort of listen to the songs and they're not quite as engaging because you can feel that the lyrics are sort of weighing them down. Or they maybe wrote the lyrics ahead of time and they're sort of retrofitting them into the song to make the song work. And Taylor's never feel like that. They feel conversational. Um, he's got a song called A Little Bit of Everything that to me is... Just it's 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 just bulletproof. And one of the things so cool about the song is it's it changes chorus lyrics every time, which is a nightmare for me. I, there's nothing I hate more in maybe songwriting than changing lyrics in a chorus. But he does to great effect. And and the, and what makes it so profound is the hook still pays off every time the same way. And 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 the first verse is about a guy that's potentially about to jump off a bridge to commit suicide. And then the way that pays off with a little bit of everything is what's stressing him out and why he feels like he does. The second verse is an older gentleman, I think, who goes to a restaurant. And when the guy says, what do you want? And instead of answering food-wise, he says, all these things and it's a little bit of everything is what I want in these sort of waning moments of my life. And the third is about a woman who's about to get married and talking about how she's giving this soon-to-be husband a little bit of everything about her. It's just so well done and he lands all of it. Just the Russian judge gives a resounding 10 out of 10 on that. Another song called, um, which I think is incredible, called All Your Favorite Bands. And think of how great this is. This is a song that is written to, to your friends. And so you think of a million things you could call that song, a title you'd want to write about to your friends. I would never come up with all your favorite bands. But the chorus is like this. It's genius. I hope that life without a chaperone is all you thought it'd be. I hope your brother's El Camino runs forever, which is, first of all, incredible, that lyric. I hope the world sees the same person that you've always been to me and, and may all your favorite bands stay together. If that doesn't just make you want to sob, and it's just so beautiful because Taylor, in writing that, he doesn't say, you're my best friend, I love you forever. He, he says what he's saying without saying it, and that, to me, is genius genius lyricism is when you're able to make a point without directly making that point you have you got me in your sweet 
dark clutches. So, um, and I'll tell you too with Taylor, uh, I knew he was good when my favorite songwriter of all time, my my favorite lyricist of all time, Emily Sawyer's of the Indigo Girls, told me in an email, "You should check Taylor Goldsmith out." And I was like, "That's the only stamp of approval I need." But I love Dawes. If you guys don't know Dawes, check them out. Taylor's a freak, and they're an incredible band. Incredible. If you get a chance to see them live, they will blow you away. So big shout out to those guys. Hot take three. I will take a double helping of a double strum all day in Elton John's incredible Rocket Man. If you guys listen to that chorus, um, I believe the guy's name is Alan Murphy that played acoustic on that track. He does this thing, and I think it's going to be a long, long. He does this thing where, you know, he just sort of throws convention out the window and bravely steps into this track and goes, you know what, I'm going to double strum because it's slow and I'm getting a little bored maybe and this will add some flair. And I think it really juxtaposes well against sort of the, the, the thinking of today in 20, you know, 20 that you sort of need to get on the grid and don't mess up and stick close and make everything tight and make sense. Um, that's pretty, that's, that's a pretty, you know, sort of wide spread thing, especially as we all have pro tools and logic that we sit and we work in, where you can line everything up. That music of the seventies is so cool. And I think it's, you know, this is one of the shining examples of just the, how they chucked convention out the window and guys just played. And if it was weird, it was weird. But I think that stuff, even on a subliminal level really adds to the heart of a track and the heart of a song because it just makes it not perfect and it makes it human, which is what we all are anyway. And the more of those things I think within reason you can have in a track, it's really cool and it just brings this weird life to a song. Um, next time you're listening to that song, I think you'll you'll laugh, listen to how much it happens in there and how much they thought, yeah, sounds right. <laughs> Hot take four. So maybe my favorite key change in all of rock and roll music is Def Leppard. You heard that right. Def Leppard, the lep. Um, Def Leppard's song Armageddon, it, which was produced and uh, written, I believe, by with Mutt Lang, who's a genius. I mean, uncontested genius. Um, but it's crazy. So I want to talk quickly about what they do because I think this is incredible um, what they're pulling off. So the song is an E. Better step inside. It's sort of this blues thing that 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 actually sounds a lot like Dire Straits to me, which is kind of weird if you get a chance to go listen to Dire Straits and especially what Mark Knopfler's guitar sounds like and how he plays it and it sounds like Def Leppard is ripping that exact vibe which is a whole I digress is a whole other subject but so it stays there so your E is your one of the of the key right and then they go to so that's the pre so you've gone from the one and the chorus and the verse to the pre is a five and then they slide up for the chorus from to C G D E minor so you've gone from the key of E to the key of G, but the way he gets in is he steps up a half step into the four of the new key. So from B to C, G, D, E, C, which is so weird and awesome and makes you feel like you're an eagle flying above the montañas of Montana. It is incredible because it's not a conventional key change he's not going from e and then trying to start with the one of the new key which would be g he goes he slides in a half step up to the four now to the one to the five six so it's like this cool like you sort of get into it subtly and not quite as like brashly and it just feels like this seismic tectonic plate shift of key that you just it's like your heart catches on fire and or maybe just me catches on fire but that is one of the coolest key changes to go from this to it is so cool mutt i tip my hat to you and if i had money i would tip you um, such an amazing key change. Next time you go listen to that song, geek with me on how cool it is that they do this five of the key, previous key, to the slide up half a step to the four of the new key, which is cool because the E, which is the one of the first key, suddenly becomes a six minor of the new key. Like that is some brash, bold key changing, and I'm here for all of it. Hot take five. We all get used to, as listeners, as music lovers and song listeners and lovers, we kind of know how songs are going to end if you know what key they're in. You're listening to them, and it could be if you, even if you don't know music. You know, you hear this. You knew that was going to land back there, right? On the one. And the, if we're in the key of G, that was just G, C, and D. 
But you know, yeah, bum, bum, you know where it's going to go next. Blah. But two songs that that just have that are magic to me. Magic Sauce Johnson, which I loved his first couple of records on Mercury. <laughs> I love what these songs do and these bands do. One, a great example of how you can take a song that you can see, it could have just stayed the same and you sort of know what's going to happen and as it's fading out, you're sort of already moving your brain to the next song or whatever you're about to do next. But they change in the last waning seconds of this song, in sort of the dying breaths, of the last dying breath of this song, a chord changes that makes you suddenly go, wait, what? Why would, what's happening now? Is there something more I need to know? Is the story not completely over? And, and it changes the way you feel. Coldplay, yellow is one of them. Look at the stars, look at the shine for you. Right, everything you do is all yellow. So that's just one C, five G, four F. But what Chris Martin and the boys, which was their original band name, I think. Chris Martin and the boys, gonna be down, down leads, playing a night in leads. Uh, he changes that five to a five minor, and all of a sudden, magic happens. So he goes, look at the stars, look at the shine for you. Oh, and you're like, I am feeling so many different things. So it just makes you feel something different. It, it, the song ends and it feels like it starts another story that now is just truncated. It's done, which is so cool. And I love that. Another song that does this is I Can't Make You Love Me by Barney Raitt. So if it's in C, which I don't know if it is, I think it's actually maybe in this key. The way she ends the song, she's been through the whole song. She goes, they sort of sit here for a second and then they go. And then the song ends on on the flat seven major seven chord so it's this really cool all she had to do at the end of the song was just blah, but but they go they add that five in the bottom they throw a four major seven and then a flat seven major seven and it's kind of there's a lot of sprinkle notes happening so it's but but you can it's it just messes your brain up and shout out to Dustin Ransom who helped me with those chords because I I was I thought I knew him but I was like if I get this wrong people are gonna kill me so shout out to DR for that. But uh, the, so it's just cool because it ends a song and you suddenly go like, oh man, I feel something again right as it ends. So it's it's not, the feeling isn't gone with both those songs, but by the time your brain kind of knows it after the bridge, there's no new information. So you're sort of just coasting off. In this, in, in both of those songs, they give you one last piece of information that sort of sets you, uh, uh, that sort of sends you off and you just kind of go, wait, what? Now I feel different. And it's so awesome because you suddenly feel a last color, a new feeling right at the end that adds to the other sort of myriad of emotions you were feeling before that makes it just that much more potent, which is just beautiful. And it's one of the reasons I love songwriting. Before I go, a quick heads up. Make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button if you want to continue the madness and rate the podcast if you feel so inclined. And I'm actually a man of multi-talents and talents there are in quotes. I figured out how to work social media so you can find me there under at Dave Barnes Music. Feel free to come enjoy the fun slash weirdness. Well, Tickle Me Elmo, that was a good time, wasn't it? It was a good time. I had a good time, which is probably selfish and definitely biased. Um, And I feel like we learned a lot. Um, but one thing we didn't learn is that Prince was in a duo with himself called Royalty. <laughs> so we'll see you next time on Days Five Hot Takes. Yeah.